today by saying thank you to you guys for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit this week. It's been very meaningful for me. I hope that you guys will put into practice some of what we've talked about. What we're going to talk about today is very important, and it's a message that uh, all of us need to hear, and we're just going to jump right into it. And the reality of a lot of our lives is that the greatest commandment shines on us and shows us that oftentimes we don't live up to what God has called us to be. Within the church, within our families, in our communities, a lot of times we don't love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength like He calls us to do. We know that everything that we do should be all about Him. Everything uh, that we live for should be for His glory. But sadly, if we take inventory of our lives, it's pretty likely that quickly we'll recognize and realize that we aren't living up to the standard that God has called us to live. We have many passions that overshadow the Lord and His work in our lives. And even the Christian things that we do, we often try to do without God. We're spiritual enough to sometimes want to do things for God, but we don't always want to do things with God. We don't always want to live with Him. And if you just take a second to think about your prayer times, are you excited to meet with God, or is it a chore or just one more thing to fit into your schedule? Are you excited about the opportunity to hear God's Word or to dig into the Bible for yourself? Or would you rather go and do something else? Now think about the opportunities that God gives you to just share how great He is and all the amazing things that He's done in your life. Do you want to go out and joyfully share? Or do you think of that as something that it's kind of a part of the Christian life, the part of Jesus' commands that you wish weren't there? Obviously, when we think about our habits and our lives, we can all see inconsistencies and recognize that we don't all live with the kind of love that Jesus commanded us to live. We try to please the Lord. We go to church. You might be a part of a youth group. You might give your money, what, whatever you make, if you've had a summer job or done anything like that. You might be trying to avoid... Uh, sins going on in your life. You might try to forgive those who do wrong to you, and these are all good things, but if they're done while living a life that's far away from God, it's not really loving Him. It's just doing things for Him. And here's maybe an example of, of what I mean when I say that. Uh, earlier this year, as happens every year, there was an event called Mother's Day. Um, and on Mother's Day... Uh, it's a great time to show love and affection uh, for your mom. It's, it's a great time to show that you care about the people uh, in your life who have just invested so much into you, so maybe your grandma too, things like that. Um, and this year, uh, I, well, I got married in, in January, and that is awesome. And in the town where we live, not too far away, my wife Jess's parents live. And so for Mother's Day, it was pretty cool because my parents live in Tennessee, and so I don't really get to see them all that much. They live 10 hours away from me. But Jess's parents live 20, 25 minutes away from us, so we can spend time with them on a regular basis. So when Mother's Day came around, we really wanted to do something that showed Jess's mom that we loved her. And we thought about, well, what are the things that she likes? And we, we said, okay, well... It's springtime, and she really likes pretty flowers and nature and trees and little streams and things like that. And so we were like, ah, we should take a trip to the local botanical gardens, and we'll go together and we'll just, you know, walk around and really enjoy being in the nature. And we tried to plan it. We found out that the day that we were hoping to be able to go near Mother's Day, she was actually unavailable. She couldn't make it. So we had two options. Either, number one, we could still go on that day, just Jess and I, and we could give her mom a ticket and she could just go when she was available. Or we could wait and set up a time when all of us could go together. Which one do you think that we did? 
Yeah, we went together. We went together, and that was the point of the whole gift. And it was a no-brainer. We never for one second considered, well, you know, maybe we could just leave her behind. We know this started out as a Mother's Day thing, but she'll still like it if she goes by herself. The whole point of the gift was to be able to go and experience something wonderful and meaningful to her together. And that's the same kind of thing that we should be thinking about when we consider living our lives with Christ. We don't want to just be doing things for Him or just trying to give Him gifts, but we should be trying to live our life closely with Him. God doesn't want us to just try and do stuff for Him. He's much more interested in us walking closely with Him. It's through that close relationship that we can see His goodness and His power, and it's through that that we can, we can know Him and worship Him and grow in our love for Him. Because the truth is that He doesn't actually need us. He doesn't need you to do anything for Him at all. He just wants to be close to us because He cares about us. And that's a big difference. And a lot of times when we think about living the Christian life, we think about, well, I'm doing some work for God. But what God really calls us to do is to live life walking closely with Him. And we're going to look at this a little bit and see what the Scripture has to say about it. In a little while, we're going to jump into Joshua 5, 13 through 15. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, you're welcome to do that. Um, and as you're turning there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Um, the, the background for this story is that God had used Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. He led them through the Red Sea on dry land. He had provided food for them miraculously in the wilderness. He had given them decisive victory over mighty enemies that had come against them and tried to stop them along the way. And the whole journey had been leading to this one place, Israel. It had been leading to the promised land. And they got there, and, and right as they arrived, God stopped the flow of this mighty raging river so that they could cross over on dry land. The people had seen God's faithfulness, and they had seen God's power, and they were trusting in Him. And now they were standing outside of this great fortress city called Jericho. And it had these impregnable high walls, and it had unbreakable gates. And the, the Hebrew people, as they were coming against it, all they really had were, were spears to attack it. And if they threw those against those stone walls, they would bounce off like they were nothing. They would have no impact. And so obviously, if God was going to give them this promised land, if they were going to take it over, it was going to take a lot of hard work. But they were trusting that God would empower them to do it because he had been faithful up until that point. So, what instruction did God give them to attack these impregnable looking walls? Well, he didn't just jump right into giving them commands and showing them how to move forward in overcoming the city. Instead, in the beginning of chapter 5, he said that his people were about to enter this foreign land, and people there worshipped foreign gods. And therefore, he wanted his people to be set apart. He wanted his people to be different. He wanted his people to show that they were attached to following him. So before attacking, they all needed to be circumcised. You see, what had happened is a whole generation of people had, had been born in the wilderness and they hadn't been dedicated to God in the way that people had been in previous times. And there was a whole generation, it says, that had missed out on that. So that's kind of a, a scary proposition. If you want to learn more about what I'm talking about as far as circumcision and what that means and is all about, you can talk to your counselors about it. It is intense and painful and, and not something that anyone would want to have happen to them as an adult. Um, but it was the way that God showed that his people were set apart for him, who were different from the people in the land. So God's people listened and they obeyed. They were willing to do something that was painful in order to obey the Lord. And in addition, they were willing to do something that was going to weaken their whole army while they were going up to what was going to be a difficult and decisive battle one way or the other, because they trusted that God's advice, God's commands, God's call for their lives was ultimately good. And that is faith at a high level. So once that had been accomplished, they were in the right place, and they had been dedicated, and they were ready to go. They were ready to fight this mighty battle for the Lord there. 
So Joshua, the leader of the people, goes and does what every good leader would probably do. He went out to survey the city. He wanted to see any possible weaknesses that were out there. He, he needed to formulate a strategy and think about how the people of Israel were going to go out into the land and, and take over this, this big, daunting city. And, and Joshua had won many battles in the past and had, had great strategy and he had a lot of experience so this was something that he was uniquely qualified to do. And God had brought them this far and now Joshua was, was moving forward as the leader of God's people and doing his part. If the people were going to fight for the Lord they would need a good plan. And so Joshua was preparing. Um, starting in verse 13 and it says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in worship and asked him, What does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, this is a crazy experience that's recorded for us. And for those of you um, Bible or theology nerds, what this is called is something called a theophany or a Christophany. And that's where Christ appears in physical form in the Bible before he was actually incarnate, before he was actually born and, and grew up in, in the New Testament story of Jesus that we see this is a, a pre-vision almost of, of Jesus working physically and actively in the Bible. And we know that this is God himself. We know that this is, this, this is the Lord and not just an angel because there are situations in the Bible where people see angels and they bow down to them and the angels say, no, no, get up. Don't bow down to me. I'm not God. You need to, to reserve your worship for him. But in this particular situation with, with Joshua, he doesn't tell him to get up. He, he goes a step further. He says, not only should you be bowing down, but it's important for you to take off your sandals because where you are is holy ground. And this is a mirror image of what Moses experienced when he came uh, close to God in the burning bush where God who introduced himself as I am called Moses to take off his sandals because he was in his presence. He was standing on holy ground. And this is the same kind of situation that Joshua is in here, face to face, experiencing the presence of God who introduced himself as the commander of the Lord's armies. And Joshua encounters God and he worships him. He's not preoccupied anymore with coming up with a strategy or thinking about how he's going to move forward, lead the people into the land. He's not thinking about what am I going to do for God. The presence of God had come into his life and it changed his focus. And now he was thinking about what am I going to do? How am I going to praise and honor God because I am with him? And in the next chapter of Joshua, we can read about how God, through his power, handed Jericho over to the Hebrew people. God did all the work for the people who were with him. And we can see that success comes from closeness. That God wins at everything that he does. So if we're walking closely with him, and if we are on his side, we will share in that success. Are you guys catching that? God doesn't ever fail. So if you are on God's side, what he accomplishes will be success for him. And because we share in that mission, it will be success for us as well. God introduced himself in what we just read as the commander of the Lord's army. In other words, he was telling Joshua that the Lord, that he was first and Joshua was second in command. And all he needed to do was stay close to the ultimate commander and follow his orders. It was the proximity to God that was important that would ensure his success. And when you're close to someone, when you can hear their voice, and when you can understand their perspective, you can understand what's going on. 
At times, words don't even need to be spoken. There can be a closeness that's just formed from being around someone often, knowing someone well, having them close in your life. You guys might have experienced this. I know I have, where you've maybe played in a musical group where it almost felt like you shared a brain with the other people who you, you were playing with, and you didn't have to say anything. You might not have even had to give somebody a look. You had been around those people. You had been practicing with those people and doing music with those people people so much that everyone was just on the same page and, and you were able to, to communicate and know what was going on because you had that kind of closeness. They knew what you're going to do. They knew where you're going to go. That comes from practicing being together. God had promised to be with Joshua. If you look back through his story, read verses like Joshua 1.5 or Joshua 1.9, we see that, jo- that God had promised he was always going to be with Joshua. But Joshua also needed to remain close to God. Relationships that succeed have have something in common. They have both sides being invested. It can't just be God being invested in your life, which he's shown that he is through the gospel. You also have to be invested in him, which is extremely important. And it can be easy for us to get sidetracked. It can be easy for us to kind of move away from seeing what's really important with our relationship with God. It's easy to focus on doing things for God even than walking closely with God. And Jesus made this awesome point in John 15, 5, where he said, you can't do anything without me. Joshua was mentored by Moses. Joshua had won many battles before. Joshua was loved by his people. Joshua was recognized as being extraordinarily wise. He was pure at heart. None of that ensured that he would have success. He needed the presence of God. He needed to be close to the Lord in order to succeed. That was the key for him, and that is the key for all of us. We can see that Joshua wanted to advance the kingdom of Israel into the promised land. You also have a similar mission. We want to advance the kingdom of God in our culture, in our home, in our communities, in our schools. We want to be moving forward with what God is trying to accomplish. And Joshua was fighting a physical battle while we are fighting a spiritual battle. battle. But Josh, but the blah, blah. But God is on our side nonetheless. And whether we're fighting some sort of um, internal battle or, or dealing with reaching out to other people, God wants us to be close to him and he wants us to be serving other people like Jesus did. But it's not as important what we do but the fact that we're doing it with him, that we're living our life close to him because he loves us, and that's the nature of what a loving relationship is about. The way that we do that is by seeking the presence of God and then following the plans of God. You guys catch that? The way that we we live for God and we, we live closely with God in this life is by seeking the presence of God and then following the plans of God. Joshua was interrupted by the commander of the Lord's army, and he was forced to his knees by the physical presence of the king of everything. And then he was able to move forward in success after he had the right perspective. After he was walking closely with the Lord, he was able to put his commands into action. And God has not only come to you as a commander, but he's also come, Jesus said, to be a friend. He has invited you to be a part of his life. He's called you into his own family. And you cannot live as an effective Christian without being a follower of Christ. You can't follow him if you aren't close to him. He wants friendship with you, and so that's an invitation to come close. So here's some some practical thoughts for us. Stop trying to live a godly life without God. Let me say that one more time. Stop trying to live a godly life without God. A lot of us have been going along, and you guys might have been doing the right things and saying the right things, but if God is not the center of your life, if you're not passionate about Him, if you're not seeking Him every day, you are not on the right track. You're just practicing religion. You're just going through the motions. You're just trying to do enough good stuff that maybe you feel good or hope that God isn't too upset with you. 
We cannot be effective Christians. We cannot be people who say that we're following Christ if we're trying to live the Christian life without God being at the center of everything that we do. And that means that we need to interrupt our routines, that maybe we need to stop, that we really need to pray, not just have a prayer time, but you need to seek the Lord, that maybe you need to to get on your knees and and just turn to Him and ask Him to, to come into your life and to give you new, renewed passion for loving Him and seeking Him and, and being close to Him. Read His Word. Don't just go through a book and say, you know, I'm going to read a chapter a day or I'm going to do my reading plan uh, through the Bible or anything like that. Love what, what God's Word has to say to you. Recognize that what He's given you is such an incredible gift because it's, it's a picture of His character, of His kindness into your life. It's amazing that He's given that to us. And, and we should do things like we do here at Chehi and, and sing, but not just focus on singing uh, the parts and not just focus on, on sounding good. Because God has... You know, he, he can hear good music whenever he wants. He's not going to be particularly impressed. Not saying that we shouldn't be excellent. But if we're excellent but not honest, that is not the kind of worship through song that God requires of us, that God desires from us. Maybe this means that, that you need to do that on your own. That you need to, to maybe sing some songs to the Lord. You know, the, the Bible calls us to do that. And maybe, maybe we need to do that not just in public, not just corporately, but maybe spend some time on your own just worshiping God through singing and using the gifts that, that He's given you in order to give Him praise and to express the love and joy and passion you have for Him. Thank Him for the gifts that He's given to you, like, like your family, like your health like your experiences in your home and your abilities. And the list could go on. You know, he didn't have to give any of those things to you. But they all come from him. And, and when we recognize that, we absolutely should be bowing down and we should be worshiping. The recognition of God's great love for our lives should, should interrupt our routine and, and cause us to just praise him. And then that overflow should affect how we live in all other areas. And for many of us, we just have too much going on. You guys might be really busy, and that can be very distracting, and it can just keep you from walking closely with God because it feels like you just don't have time. Maybe that means that you need to simplify, and it is very simple. If there's so much going on in your life that you can't walk closely with Christ, you've got the wrong stuff going on in your life. You've got too much happening because it doesn't matter if you do all the things that you're supposed to do and miss out on the one thing that God has called you to do and the one thing that God has called you to be. We need to simplify, not be too busy because if we're too busy living life for Christ, then we're not really living at all. And for many of us, we've allowed sin and selfishness to become entrenched in our lives. And we need to learn to hate sin because it keeps us from Jesus. We need to kill it and make room in our lives for Christ. You can't love sin and love Christ without having disaster. Think about, think about having your life go in two directions at the same time. It's just going to cause you to fall. It's like if you had one leg following Christ over here and one leg following sin over here, eventually you're going to end up doing what I am not willing to do right now. Um, but... For, for us, we need to recognize that you can't be going in two directions at the same time. And if we're following something that leads us away from Christ, you are not walking closely with Him. That's a harsh and difficult message, but that is a reality for our lives. That, that we cannot, like Jesus says, serve two masters. And If you remember how we started this message, we talked about uh, the greatest commandment. God's call for us to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have you ever noticed that God doesn't call us to love Him first? He doesn't call us to give Him the most. Instead, instead He says that we're supposed to love Him with our all, with everything that we've got. He's not supposed to be our first priority He's supposed to be our only priority. Through the cross, he showed us that, 
that we are his priority and he laid down his life for us and he called us his friends and he's proven that he's on our side. He is with us. And like with Joshua, he is ready to fight for us. He is ready to win your battles. He is for us. And, and the New Testament tells us in Romans 8 that if God is for us, we can ask the rhetorical question, who can possibly be against us? Because who can be against him? His love and power is not in question. And he is with us. That is not in question. The question is, are you with him? God gave Joshua this impregnable city of Jericho when Joshua was with the Lord, and he didn't have to climb one wall, and he didn't have to move one brick. God did everything. He fought for his people. God can do the absolute impossible, and he can do amazing things in your life as well. If you will draw close to him, and if you will bow down, and if you will make him your priority, and if we do that, God will use us. God will use you to change the world. He will bless you and he will fight for you. So let's not be people who try to live for God without God. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for how amazing you are for the, the great power that you have and for the love that causes you to show that power in our lives. And God, I pray for the students who are here today and I ask that you would um, just be working in them, that you would, you would open their eyes to see that the most important thing about life is living with you. And we know that, that you've said that eternal life is completely wrapped up in knowing you and being close to you. That's what we're going to live for forever. And God, I pray that these students would start uh, living closely with you now. That you would help them to see the things that are distractions and that you would eliminate those things. And I'd help you, I ask that you would help them to um, just see that, that the other things that call for them uh, to move away from you and maybe pursue things that don't please you, God, I ask that, uh, that they, they would see that, that it's not worth it. Most of all, God, I pray that they would recognize that just going through the motions and doing the Christian things, going down the checklist, doesn't mean that we're close to you. God, grow our passion. And help us to truly seek to walk closely with you every day and in everything that we do. And it's in your awesome name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.